Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash, The Devil and the Gay Wear Prada, and Dale Hummel. America, welcome to the Hunger Games. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel along with Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Ryan, it's it's been another eventful week. I think even as much so as the election week with Miss USA. I've had a ton of events. I've been very busy, the most busy. So when I judged this hog show and burn it and Animal Planet showed up and then they decided to put this mic on me and that was all of a mess and I was afraid what I might say under my breath while I stood in the show. I was the most scared, so I don't know if there was a hot mic moment or not, but... That was something, and... No, that, that is really... You, you know what I think of Animal Planet, right? You love the Animal Planet of it all. You know Crocodile Hunter was the best animal behaviorist And ever. I am going to tell ever. you again, Crocodile Dial Hunter is dead. Fluke accident. He, he survived so many times. Dale, he died 20 years ago. Fluke accident. Great animal behaviorist. And if you could get Animal Planet to get you and I into a shark cage dive, oh, the best. They weren't there filming me. They were there filming the hog show. So I just happened to be judging said hog show. You have no pull with Animal Planet. I don't know. The lady that interviewed me after the hog show, she told me that she had never met someone as charismatic and articulate. And she was just completely floored that I had not been found before. I did not go into my story that I have had my bouts with reality TV people before, (laughs) and they did not go over well. You did not disclose you tried to run over the producer? No, that I ran over the producer. There there was no try. I accomplished it. But um, anyhow, so I don't know. They did contact me since then and got a schedule of other events that I would be judging and said they would get back with me later. But, you know, it was just during— the start of Rona that a lady thought she was going to make me the next reality thing. And then she told me to quit posting positive things about Trump on Facebook. And when I told her I want it, she dropped me like hot data. So, (laughs) and they did ask me not to bring up anything presidential election in my post-show interview. So, you know, again, they probably got enough of that in the grand drive speech, but. They probably knew where you sat at that point. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> the most. Well, maybe maybe they're just trying to stay non-political and they're not biased themselves. Maybe it's okay. <laughs> I, I know Crocodile Hunter. He was conservative. <laughs> Again, Crocodile Hunter's dead. And then I went back to my hotel room in Austin and I got thrown out of gay bar. And <laughs> then I went to the Miss USA pageant. So that was fun. It was in Memphis, which was a little depressing and scary. But... Pageant was good. There was only 250 people in the audience. It was extremely social distanced. I mean, extremely. Like a kind of a Joe Biden news conference social distance? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, wow. it, it was something. <laughs> they they had different three different packages. I was the platinum package, and only 28 people could buy into the platinum package. There was two of us that kind of bought our tickets together, so we were at a table. But if you bought your tickets by yourself, you were at this little table by yourself and at the rest of the audience extremely social distance so yeah it, it was wild the young lady that won asa brant she's from mississippi she was also miss mississippi america two years ago she's a beautiful girl very very intelligent she is a pro-trump supporter she actually sang at one of his mississippi rallies the national anthem i thought she gave great answers in her top five Question, she got asked about racial diversity, and she said that we just didn't trust anybody anymore. We didn't trust the media. We didn't trust each other, and we didn't trust the political systems. And for any divide to be healed, we all had to regain that trust, and it was going to take more than— that was a question asked by the judge, but then they also had to draw a topic. Her topic was gun control, and she stated— that she absolutely believed in, and it was also about defunding the police. She did not think, she stated that she didn't defund police. Second Amendment right was very important to her. She was raised around guns and knew how to load, fire, and shoot from a very early age. And that while she thought that, you know, more people 
should learn about gun safety, but we should not take away our second minute right. So this this is really good. I I would have assumed, and I have not been to a pageant beyond a county fair pageant many, many years ago, but I would have assumed those answers would not have been politically correct with those judges. The panel were all women, six, and I, I, I would say that they probably, there might have been two conservatives on there, Republicans, but I don't know. I mean, she's very articulate by the first place, but I, I was really shocked they crowned her. You know, the first question about diversity, that was okay. And, you know, I mean, it was a good answer, but I thought that was a little on the edge. When she ran home the Second Amendment thing, I was like, oh, girl, this is so sad because you just lost it. But they didn't. But she was also the only one of the top five. All the other ones kind of had a big blunder in their top five answer. Well, you would have assumed her to be penalized for being real and honest. When she gave this, I mean, it was that strong on the Second Amendment and that we should not have more gun control, I thought that she had gone too far. In most pageants, that would have. National pageants, that probably would hurt you. You know, if you're running for Miss Texas or Miss Mississippi and you say, yeah, I'm sticking to my guns, then you're going to be fine. But at a na- on a national stage, yeah, I thought that was probably. But I was wrong. Now, that, that brings me to your Snapchat. I did see a young lady in your Snapchat that I haven't seen before. Well, that's because you don't follow my Facebook enough. Uh, the young lady in my Snapchat is Electra, and she was Miss Tennessee America a couple of years ago. Very dear friend of mine, and she is now running for Miss Tennessee USA in March. And so I met her up there, and we were plotting, planning, and scheming uh, for that pageant in March 11th through 13th. So she attended with you or just happened to be there? Yeah, well, we met up there. She's from Tennessee, of course, but, I mean, her parents actually live in Memphis, and she now lives in, because of her job, she lives in Chattanooga, but— we were scheming for the Miss Tennessee. Why would she be there with you? Because, Dale, I'm fabulous. No, I think you're trying to be politically correct and get her exposure. Oh, well, I mean, that probably, I'm not saying I didn't, but yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't anybody want to attend a pageant with me? Hello? That's intriguing. I would like to go, I'm, I'm going on the record, I would like to attend Miss Universe, if you could take care of it. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, they've got to announce when Miss Universe is, but they say it's coming up in February. I'll keep you posted on that. Okay. I have something I think needs to happen, depending on whether we have Mr. Trump in the White House or not in the White House. But how about You're going to Trump- steal my idea and claim no, it as yours. This, this was mine from almost a year ago. No, it was not. I am the one that told you that Trump needed his own television no, network. No, 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 no. What about a social media platform as well? I did not say anything about a social media platform because he owns all the social media platforms already. Right now, he has how many? 70 million something votes, which would assume would, would transfer into some following, that he could do it right now. Trump News Network, social media platform. I, I am all in. I think there's a lot of conservative America that would jump in. You don't want me to tell you what I think of Fox News right now. Well, I tried to tell you that for three weeks, and you told me I was wrong. In fact, I think it was on the this podcast last week, which you told scolded me for being so hateful. Oh, I do not recall that. Listeners, play the tapes. No, no, no. Play no, it no, back. No, no, yes, no, no, no. Yes, you only sir, listen you like did. Snapchat. You'd listen to it once, and it's gone. <laughs> no, no. You yeah. scolded me for being uh, very oh. negative about Fox News, and now you want to kill him. Kaylee McEnany was giving a news briefing during Neil Cavuto's show. I'm watching it for, I, I just happened to, to walk in the house, and that's on. They pulled away from the briefing because she made a comment they were not sure that she had the facts to back it up. Are you kidding me? How many times have we heard Nancy, Chuck, AOC, many of the others preach on the crazy left Information's clearly not factual, and they run that anyway. Explain, Ryan, please. I I did explain to you. You didn't listen to me, just like you never listen to me. The new executive vice president of Fox News used to be Joe Biden's chief of staff. I can't make this up. Just like that, we we start pulling this kind of crap. And I don't know if it's Neil that pulled it, a producer. I have no idea, but it it absolutely shocked me that they weren't. How could you let anybody say anything? If you think that you have to fact check as there's, I'm, I'm absolutely confused. I'm out on Fox. I'm trying Newsmax. The man's name is Danny O'Brien and he is the new VP of Fox News. And he used to be at some point a chief staff for Joe Biden. That explains a lot. 
And I'm not saying I won't watch Tucker or Hannity or Laura, maybe even Fox and Friends on occasion. But when we get into that midday and some of those others, and just in general, I would prefer not to support Fox until things turn around, if they turn around. And, and it's what you're telling me that probably is not going to. I would not think so. And I tried to explain to you, and again, when you told me Chris Wallace was going to be such a fair debate moderator, which we all, all right, I mentioned, I hope that he is. Yeah, well, that didn't work out. and No, that did not work. That did not work. And again, a lot of this goes back to the fact that in the 2016 election cycle, Roger Ailes was the president of Fox News. He had a Me Too faux pas, and he got dismissed. And little by little, I think it's been there, but we had it was not as prevalent until the end of this election cycle. But it's definitely there now, and I don't see it changing. Uh, again, if Trump does not stay in the White House, I think he could make a killing by having his own mainstream media network. But the, I hope that he does this. We still don't know. With Fox, I always assumed, and, and I, maybe this was because they came in long ago, Donna, Brazil, Juan, I thought they brought the idiots in from the left just to make it sound like they were unintelligent. That I can't tell you. I mean— You can. You have an opinion. You just don't want to state it. I, I do. No. Well, I think Juan is— not someone of the intelligence level to be on a mainstream media network. And what about Miss Brazil? Well, like I told you, I hate that bitch. That's just all there is to that. And she's a cheater and she has no ethics or morals or anything. So I don't know why she would be on there at all. There's nothing. I, I think she's there to, to represent the other side poorly. And that works. What is more important than Fox or this other stuff is who is going to be the president. And I love the fact that the media networks have decided that Joe Biden is going to be the president, but that's not exactly how it works. And I know they don't <laughs> realize that, but that's not how it works. No, it does seem to be a problem. You know, there's lots of steps that actually go into deciding who is the next president after the votes are counted and all this. And none CNN, MSNBC, Newsmax, or, you know, Fox get consulted in that process. I just want people to know. but. Uh, evidently, I, I like I said, I was at the pageant, and so I have not got to watch a lot. But I do know that Trump announced yesterday that he is going full steam ahead with all of his litigation into what he feels is a very corrupt and fraudulent election in a lot of places. And he keeps putting these things out there, but we have not seen, which I'm sure the reason why is they're saving this for the court battles or whatever, but there hasn't been been a lot of accusations. I don't know if we've seen overwhelmingly proof that can be verified and hold up in a court of law yet. Not saying it's not there. Well, there is a chance that Kaylee was going to tell us about some of those, but they did not allow me to watch it. Let it go, Frozen. Anyway. <laughs> we better talk about the Georgia Senate runoff a little bit. I'm assuming that Trump is going to take this as far as he can which would be to the Supreme Court. There's several avenues that he can go from the mail-in ballots that were received after the polling places closed to he's alleged that there were dead voters and all this other stuff. Glitches in, states. in the system. and, the, and Right. And lots. Glitch, I mean, and some of this stuff has been proved. Like in Michigan, in one county, there was a computer glitch that counted 6,000 Republican votes as Democratic votes. That same computer system was in 47 counties. It was used in Georgia some. So there are things. But again, it's all got to come out and all got to be played out. It's all got to do it rapidly. I, I stated on Facebook, whoever is sworn in on January 20th, 2021, is who I will accept as the president of the United States. I think that I am in the majority, in the minority of that. I believe that President Trump will push this legally. I don't know that it's going to get flipped. I can be hopeful that it's going to. But what I do hope is that we get some type of election reform and consistency and implement a little bit of common sense into the process because this this situation that we're dealing with right now, it should not be that difficult. It should be pretty straightforward, pretty clean. Uh, I think I am in the minority of that. And, and I'm not saying that Trump shouldn't do all this. Uh, Again, it's his right, and I do think that there was some definitely questionable things that happened. I do think election reform needs to happen. I think the bottom line, no matter what, is 
is I don't think whether Trump stays in the White House or Joe Biden takes the White House, I think half the country is going to think that that's an illegitimate president. And that's the bottom line. I think that's where we've been for four years. Eh, I think this will be way worse. I really do. If we assume Trump doesn't hold the White House, the Georgia Senate runoff is absolutely critical. People, I don't know. Today, they did call the North Carolina Senate race for the Republican, Tillerson, and uh, Cunningham did concede. So right now, of course, again, and found it funny that somebody commented that they were listening from Alaska. They still have not got all the wild bison (laughs) riders into town to get their votes counted because they're only at 58%. But Trump and the Senate race in Alaska are still going very, very well. So we would think that it would be, when that is counted and official, it will be 50 Republicans, 46 Democrats, and two independents that caucus with the Democrats. So that would bring their total to 48. That leaves the two Georgia seats. I I did not check, but I was under the impression that both of them were still going to a runoff. Dale, you think it's different. I, I saw something at 50%. That might have been North. I, I don't know. I don't think it was probably uh, Georgia. I, maybe that was wishful thinking in my, my little world. But If both of those Georgia races go to a runoff, it'll be one Republican against one Democrat, and whoever gets the most votes will win. If Democrats think $2 billion into that race. They are going to sink a lot of money into it. It doesn't mean they're going to win. And win both of them, mm. then it would be 50-50. And if Camel Toe is the vice president, she splits the ties in the Senate. Painful, painful, painful. And that changes everything. As Chuck Schumer clearly pointed out that you may have missed that we're going to Georgia for the Senate race. Once we win that, America will change. Mm-hmm. Or we're changing well, that will, it, If they win both of those and Camel toes the vice president, the whole thing has changed. There is no doubt. I don't think people understand. We can we can survive losing the White House. We cannot survive losing the White House and the Senate. It just I'm I'm not trying to be over dramatic. I don't want to exaggerate. I'm just telling you we cannot. If you've ever considered donating to a political race, this is a political race you need to throw some dollars at. Ryan, get on that. The night and the morning after the election. I really thought we were going to pick up a seat in the Senate because I thought the black gentleman from Michigan, he was firmly winning. And so I thought, okay, we're going to win. We're going to at least secure one of those Georgia ones. We've got North Carolina. We got all this. And we're going to get this pickup in Michigan. I thought we were going to pick up a seat in the Senate. Well, that all went to hell and here we are. If they do have a 50-50 tie and she is the president of the Senate and gets the deciding vote and ties, all of that stuff we were afraid of. Yep, it's real. We're running long as usual in current events, but Ryan, do you know what we haven't discussed in a long time? You know what we have not discussed in a long time? One particular country. China! (laughs) Good call. Let me paint this picture. Okay, the night of the election, Trump's leading early on in the night. We're all pretty darn excited that Trump's going to have another four years in the White House. Obviously, the rest of the world is watching this. What do you think's happening in the Chinese stock market at that time? Crash, burn, destroy. I mean, it was, it was, it was going down hard. How does the left pretend that China would rather have Trump in the White House than Joe Biden? How is, isn't something like this just very black and white that China does not want President Trump for another four years? I, I'm I, I just the lies that are put out there and the misleading information, it frustrates me. Well, that's why you're watching Newsmax that's filmed in a basement. And I'm gonna give it a chance. I hope it works because I, I am I am frustrated with Fox. Are you ready for the main topic? Sure. Today's main topic is sponsored by Cowpokes Work and Western, located in Anderson, Indiana. Those of you at the North American or heading that direction, I strongly encourage you to stop by Cowpokes. This year, they are located in the West Hall meeting rooms, W5 through W10. Cowpokes has become as iconic at the North American as the famed Duck Slide. If you cannot attend Louisville this year, you can shop at cowpokesonline.com 24-7. Again, it is our sponsors that allow this podcast to continue each and every week. Please return the favor and check out Cowpokes for your stock show clothing needs. 
The topic this week, Ryan, revolves around a term that is defined differently by many in our industry. Ryan, I think you and I can find common ground on what it means when we use the term structural correct and other terms similar to such. Are you wide open for it, Ryan? Sure, why not? I mean, go for it. Can we can we both agree that that you and I value structural integrity probably as much as anybody out there? Well, I know I do. I I I I've been watching some big shows here lately and and yeah. It's it's something that that I I really get excited about talking about and we're going to take it a couple different directions today. And I think the the definition or or everybody understanding what is meant. I I guess what what I'm trying to get at is when a judge talks about structural correctness or structural integrity or skeletal build or however you want to phrase that, I'm not so sure we're talking about the exact same thing. Ryan, can you you can paint a picture for us in the show ring when you're looking at take whatever species, cross species. What are you thinking about? What do you, what do you consider to be structurally correct or a good build? It's a lot easier to describe animals than it is to paint a broad picture of one. But I guess for me, what I what I would consider to be ideal is that all of the angles on that animal that are adjacent and associated with their feet and legs and their spine are correct. Also, that they fill their track for lack of a you know fluffier term. Uh, in terms of the way that they move, they are right on their corners. They're not too wide. They're not too narrow. Their hooves and toes and everything point the correct direction. And uh, in terms of their joints, they're smooth jointed. Basically, those are the things that I look at and decipher out. And in terms of when I'm sorting them, you know, there's never been a perfect one built in any way. But those are kind of the main attributes that I look for when I'm sorting structure and animals. I love it. And, and that's why we're going to agree on this more than not. And with, with Ryan's description of that, I think he's found the balance there of what we like to see in our mind as humans in the show ring. And a little bit, Ryan, I know you don't even like this, but you, you almost, when they're filling the track and, and getting around the ring, there's a little bit of form to function in terms of the angles all being correct. Oh, sweet Jesus. <laughs> and I know that when we talk about some of these things, and, and I want to discuss some issues within species, but a lot of times the show ring, what some prefer visually are straight lines, including a straight top line, feet, pointing directly forward, level from hooks to pins. We can drop a plumb line from their pin bone straight down through their hock to the back of their hoof. We like things in straight lines. I, I don't know that that's truly functional, but within reason, I think there's a balance there. And I think Ryan put it into words as best you can, talking about how their angles are correct. And, and I guess to me, from a skeletal build standpoint, and, and I could be very much in a minority or off in left field, it's the ability to get around in motion and hold themselves together while in motion. And everything is is correct. The joints are flexing. The angles are correct. All of those things come together, allowing that animal to move out with some grace and hold themselves together. And, and that requires, I guess, in my mind, you've got to balance between that attractive look that we, we have these straight lines in, in place that, that are just normal for, for show judges to go out there and try to select and still being correct enough in their joints and flexible enough in their joints that they can they can really get around that ring and and look good on the move. So it's it's interesting to me and and when we talk about and, and Ryan's gonna love this part, if we talk about Mother Nature evolution, when we talk about the wild animals, go way out there, way, way out there on this one. This would be what if you want to go to the extreme. Close your ears now, people. <laughs> okay. The extreme there's no question that Mother Nature is selecting for longevity. To explain structural correctness from that standpoint, and we go back to form to function, this does not necessarily include straight lines. It doesn't include front feet pointing straight forward and rear feet pointing straight forward, but rather a little bit looser skeletal design, maybe designed a bit more towards what we call just functional. And and they they don't always look. We probably have a little more set to the rear hock in, in, in the wild world or Mother Nature's world. We have some differences, but I think there's Mother a Mother Nature was there. never asked to judge a stock show down. No, no, and you know what? And I, I want to make sure before I get too deep, before I hang myself. You've already hung yourself. No, okay, I'm going to back The up. noose is tight, and you are choking and dangling, uh, and I'm not saving you. Okay, I want to go, I want to move then. I'm going to move backwards a little bit. Before I get too far into the episode, I want to state with human intervention, some 
animals or some livestock do not need to be as functional as they would be in the real world environment or the wild environment or any of those things. An example would be the show stock industry or the stock show industry. In reality, commercial livestock do not always need to be perfect regarding structural correctness to make it, say, to the marketplace. A terminal animal doesn't have to be perfect. In the stock show world, we tend to adjust and adapt that environment, whether we're putting pigs on sand, whether we're putting cattle out in a a soft dirt lot and getting them off the concrete. We're going to adapt the environment to accommodate whatever we have to to make them hold together and, and survive. Now, this is not the real world. We don't want to pretend it is. So I'm, I'm just using the example. Here's Mother Nature. Here's the show ring. We can maybe learn a little bit, just a little bit from each of them. But if we, if we continue to, to go down that path, I, I know there's a balance that we need to find. I acknowledge the form to function. I, I filling that front leg leaves, and you can almost see that print in the dirt or the, or the, the sand around the ground, and that, that calf sets that hind leg right in that same footprint. We talked about that or filling the step. Think about hogs. And we'll go into them specifically. They don't even come remotely close. We're swinging behind more than than moving forward. So there's there's a lot of things. And I guess in my mind, if if we can set these show stock into motion and they can look as good, and I would love to, to see those that throw their head up real arrogant, can look even better than they do when they're stuck or set up. Those are the ones that I think have structural integrity and correctness. If they can do all those things, that's where I'm at in terms of of a balance. It's a, a huge pet peeve of mine. And Mother Nature, or is this just you alone? <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, we're going to goat shows all over the country, and there's so many good showmen now. We can get some of these goats propped up really well, and they look the part. I mean, if you just walked up there and that person has that goat stuck, you think, wow, there's one. And they let off that one to go on the move, and that thing just falls apart and looks more like a goat. And, and that's not a good thing. We don't like goats looking like what we, we think of as traditional goats. But they absolutely completely fall apart. AKA Mother Nature's goat. Exactly. Remember, I'm a hypocrite on the the goat side. I'm no, right. I don't, don't really follow the, along here. Mother Mother Nature in the real world doesn't apply to the goats. But okay, Ryan, what what stock show piece, species do you consider currently to be the most challenged structurally in the show ring? I, I don't even know where to begin with that whole Mother Nature talk. So we're just going to move on past that. <laughs> just skip it. And again, I, I apologize to everyone that had to enter that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, the reason that I, I love sorting hogs for two reasons. And number one is there are more structural differences in hogs than any other species, I think, for luck. Structure is the thing that I love to watch and break down not only in my mind, but on the microphone that is a big reason that I love judging hogs. The other reason I love judging hogs is I know far less people in that industry. Not that it ever matters if I know you or not, but I just don't know many people in that industry. I don't race them. I don't sell them. I don't show them. And so, like, I find it highly entertaining to get to judge them because it is truly just a perspective completely out there from what they are used to in terms of the fact that I'm not someone that's been influenced or by any of that. And so those are the two reasons I like to do that. I do think that, you know, I'm not trying to brag on cattle people, but I would say that if we're just judging the whole, I would think that structure is probably better in the majority of show cattle than it is any other species. But I think they've worked at it longer than any other species. So they should be ahead. I would agree. There's There's been more selection pressure put on that, and I still think there's room in, in all of them to keep going forward. But Again, you asked me which one I thought had the most challenges. I just wanted to give a shout-out to the cattle people because I think that they have made the most improvements than any other species in that area. Mother Nature's agent there's always room for improvement, but I, I would agree we've had more selection pressure for a longer period, it seems, as as though on that. And, and swine, have we continued it to go in cycles and trends, and it keeps going forwards, backwards, every, every direction. But let's talk about swine specifically, and, and I guess I uh, had a chance to, to watch a little bit of the breeding hog show at Kansas City and a few other hog shows recently, and, and I'm seeing the same thing, and maybe it's always been here, and I hear it's popping up quite a bit in the Yorkshire breed right now, but if I go back in time, there used to be a lot of problems with Hampshire hogs as they come at you. They used to call it coon-footed up front, where their pastures are pretty down. I do not down. think you can use that term, sir. 
<laughs> got it. I'm going to use it. That's what the it is. What it is. We coon are think so about a raccoon. How they Lord. think about how that raccoon goes down on that that front pastern, and then they sometimes walk on the outside. So envision this hog coming at you. You don't have to envision it. Most hogs in the country <laughs> do this right now. It's you see it all the time. Deep shavings will cover it up. But this hog's coming at you. We're soft, broken down in those pasterns. And then we're so outside ourselves from opening these hogs up so, so much that we're almost walking on the outside of our toe. We need to rebalance things. We've got pressure points going to places that they shouldn't be. I know that the old Hampshire breeders used to call it coon footed and they'd start walking inside or on the outside of that toe with that broken down pastern. And this, this is a problem. And you see it in the crosses, you see it in the Yorks. I, I think at a certain point when they come at me like that, I don't care how good they are. I have a hard time accepting the rest of the good because of that serious problem. And I get it. We've made these bodies so opened up and so amazing. Pressure points are going to be unlike where Mother Nature would like to have them. And consequently, we're going to see things like this. And you get around behind the same hog. Instead of those front legs going forward, we're just swinging that hip from side to side and I've watched some of these shows, and, and it seems like this is just okay. We just accept it. And, and I have a harder time with that. I watched Ryan judge a couple pig shows, and, and he certainly puts more emphasis and brings these things out. But you get it in situations, and I know it all needs to be a balance. We don't need to single trait select for structural correctness. But I think there is a line there that we, we have to have them within an acceptable window of correctness, particularly coming out of their front end and maybe in that rear hock, that they, they can be used up towards the top of the class or even further. And that's that's a fine line because, as Ryan talked about, he enjoys sorting hogs because there are so many skeletal differences and they are easy to see and easy to point out. But there's there's some issues in what we call just being outside of their skeleton, not to mention maybe a little straight in the knee and a little straight in that rear hock. What happens when we're too straight in the knee and too straight in the rear hock? In order for those hogs to move, they've got to compensate and, and they break down their pasterns and they're way more flexible there which does allow them to move, and it, it seems to be accepted. I know, Ryan, you, you talk about it a lot. You talk about you just want to replace the rear wheels. I, I've, I've heard you many times. But this is something that maybe I'm not paying enough attention to a lot of those that are judging these shows, and they're, they're putting more emphasis on this. But in my opinion, I think the hogs, as you stated earlier, they have as much room for improvement from a structural standpoint and movement standpoint as any species. But at the same time, they're so amazing in the rest of their body. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. I think, like, and we've mentioned this on other podcasts, not the structural part, but, like, we talked about, oh, and your breeding versus market nonsense that we had to go through. Like, the body build of fine swine these days, they've got it down. Wide, square, opened up. They, they've had the ones with the cool looking front and, you know, all of that going on. And they're standing on, you know, like huge, big bone and feet and all that. And so I think that they have from the hocks up pretty much spot on. It's just uh hocks down and, you know, and sometimes in their spine and stuff like that, maybe not so much, but I, I think they are as close to any species in terms of building the perfect chassis. I think that they're there. I, I agree completely. And, and we're, we're trying to make those necks tie a little higher out of the shoulder. And there's a lot of these judges, when those hogs come out of the gate, if that head isn't up there, cranked up there, they're not even going to look at them. And I'll tell you what, for a head to be up that high and for that hog to get out and move well, good luck finding very many of those. We can crank that head up, but we get a lot of stubber, stutter steps and some issues coming with that. And if we want to make hogs taller fronted or any livestock taller, this the quick way that happens sometimes is we just straighten all the joints up and, and that definitely gives us a little more elevation. So we, we have to be cautious and be, be careful with some of those things. As we open up that, that center and try to make these hogs wider, occasionally we'll get them a little bow legged behind and, and it certainly makes them look a little wider, but from a structure or skeletal standpoint, maybe just a little bit of an issue. I'm actually going to agree with you on one point of this whole conversation. And that's great because so far it hasn't been so much, but I t most shows that I judge in hog shows, they always start with showmanship. And everybody knows that it doesn't matter what species it is. I like a sexy, good-looking one. So what is the first thing the kids do? They, like, rap, tap, 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 tap on those hogs' heads to get them as high up there as they can. Well, the first thing that they, 
that does is just like you said, it completely inhibits their movement. And uh, it's the same concept with, you know, putting a stick in front of a calf's nose, you know, whatever you do, if you do anything with an instrument or the way, you know, you, it, when you're holding a lamb or a goat, that inhibits that animal from moving at the rate of speed that it's the most comfortable with, then it's not going to let them get out and move as well. And so that's one of the things when I judge hog showmanship, I tell it almost every time. We all know I like a sexy one, but I like a sound one just as much as I like a sexy one. I can figure out how good their necks are and how cool fronted they are without you trying to keep that thing up on his toes and his neck and his so high and his, you know, snout pointed to the stars. But uh, so, yeah, that point that you made there is absolutely right on getting those necks so high. So I just wanted to say that I agreed with you on something, and that will probably be the end of it for this <laughs> topic. But. No, we're we're going to move into goats here shortly. But I I and I think we'll agree on that because remember I have no practicality in goats whatsoever. But mother Ryan's nature, point, no 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 mother nature, <laughs> no mother nature, in the goats. And, no 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 no. So on the on the hog side of it, obviously these kids have really been trained and coached to get that head up that high. And if I could just offer one little bit of advice, and, and Ryan has already done it. Just real simple, let's let it come down just a little bit to where it's maybe a touch more natural for them to get out and move rather than all the way up there. If they can crank that head all the way up there, especially do it without a lot of tap, 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 and get out there and move, I'm all in. But it's hard to make animals, especially hogs, do that naturally. There are a few that can do it, and those those are really cool when they get it done. Goats, Ryan, there's a couple issues with goats that cause me problems with thinking of them as being correct in their skeletal build or structurally correct, however you want to word it. And these issues are mother nature. Mother nature has not created a goat to be a show ring animal. It just is nothing to do with it. Zero. And then when we think about how narrow these goats have started off with, and we can, we can blame it on mother nature again, that they're just had no muscle. This is lack there of muscle. We've had to put so much emphasis and so much push towards muscle for so many years because we've had fewer years to selectively breed goats as show stock, what happens when we single trait select that hard, Ryan? Uh, you are evidently the one that has the Mother Nature bat phone. So by all means, <laughs> please inform me what she has to say about this in y'all's deep discussions. It doesn't matter what species or, or human. I don't care what it goes into. Anything we're breeding and we breed for one specific trait, we can make great progress in that trait. But the rest of the, the traits are going to fall random. And when we're putting so much muscle into these goats, we're going to have some other issues pop up. We're going to be out, just like we talked about the pigs, we're going to be a little outside of themselves up in their shoulder, outside of their skeleton. We're going to have some bow-legged goats. We're going to have some top lines that anytime we open up a goat in that forerib and, and try to widen them up, we're going to break behind the shoulder. There's, there's a lot of other things that can come with it. I think we have gotten to a point in the weather goat industry that the top end has enough muscle. And I, I, if you'd asked me this a few years ago, I'd have said, I don't know if we'll ever get there, but there's some pretty heavy muscle goats out there. Now let's try to build them better. And that's much, much more complicated. Everybody can look at an animal and say, this one's heavy muscled, average muscled, light muscled. But to get them built better and get them to tie everything together correctly, that is more difficult than we've got to select for all of these things without losing too much of the muscle that we put into them. So it's, it's a challenge. The show weather world has made crazy progress, getting body type and, and muscle more like other stock, but we still have a, a lot of work to do, and, and hopefully we can we can get to that that point. It's it's frustrating to me that we'll have some show judges out there that they see these really really wide fronted weathers and they they say, well, they're really wide chest and they're really opened up, but in all actuality, they've gone so far. I don't know how else to state it. They're they're outside their skeleton. Ryan, how do you describe that? Well, I think that something that you just brought up there kind of is the basis of my whole philosophy of judging. And I think the fact that you stole it is quite rude. And I'm going to have to now, (laughs) you plagiarized me. and um, Without even knowing it, but I'm not going to deny it. You knew. You knew, sir. You knew. You you were like Biden, stealing my shit from me. (laughs) Damn See, I Democrat. don't doubt that it fits because we're, we're talking about goats, remember? No practicality. Um, but one of the big things when I judge stock is kind of something you said, like, 
I think it is the easy. I think the easiest thing to do, whether it's breeding or in terms of additives and things out there, to put on a show animal's muscle. Like you can do it in one generation in a mating. There are more proven additives and enhancements to add muscle mass and dimension than anything else in the world. There's not, it's not as easy genetically or enhancements to make them real cool looking. And the hardest thing to do genetically, and I don't know of any enhancements that actually work in terms of building them impeccably well so they can be awesome structured, that's that's not out there. And so I guess when I go through these things in my mind, I always like, I, and I use this term a lot, finding the ones that are the hardest to build. Well, I think structure is at the forefront of being the hardest to build. And so that's why it's so important to me. So again, plagiarist. <laughs> Well, I, I and I, I we we do agree very much on this one. And and if we talk about even even level hip goats, there are level hip goats in the world, Ryan. They're called dairy goats. They're perfect from their hooks to pins in terms of being level. When we try to level out a, a hip in in our today's weather industry, we are going to lose muscle. It just is what it is. If we're looking at natural muscle, not man made, truly heavy muscle goat, it's going to be a touch rounder hip than maybe where we want that ideal to be in our mind. It's just part of it. it. It is what it is. And there's not a lot of changing that. Now I say that and we go and look at the sheep ring and wow, we've got these dead level hip lambs that are massive. So maybe someday, I, I hope it's it's done organically and through genetics and not maybe other directions. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's move on to cattle. Would you like to discuss cattle? Uh, sure. We're, we're, I mean, we, we were on goats and you led into lambs, but we can switch to cows. Sure, fine. No, we, yeah, no, no, cattle's, cattle fits in much, much better because lambs are going to sound too much like goats. But. Evidently, he's taught to Mother Nature and he needs to go to cattle next. Yes. Okay. No, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, all the same. Oh, okay. Um, cattle, and, and Ryan complimented that there's there's been a lot of progress made in terms of movement and skeletal builds in cattle. And, and I agree with that. I can remember many, many years ago, and it was primarily in the Simital breed, the first time that I was conscious of uh, an, a, something that bothers me in the show ring and bothers me in the everyday world is some of these cattle come in the ring and they're really popping those pasterns pretty hard. I'm not talking about every 10th step, but every other step. And I understand this can be an environmental stress. We there's lots of reasons and lots of theories on this, but if we're going to talk about cattle, I would like to address that one to a certain extent. And, and I've had people tell me, and, and, and I believe they're correct to a certain degree, we shouldn't maybe worry about it because we don't see a lot of popping pastern in cows. I'm not going to say they don't exist, but there's probably less than what we see out there in the show ring. So it is it is. This something. would go back to your form of function bullshit. Uh, we're not judging cows. <laughs> We are not judging cows. You're right. I, I get pretty hard on, on those pasterns that pop, but at the same time, I understand sometimes stress, sometimes the hull, sometimes concrete. Lots of things can contribute to that. But if we go back to Mother Nature and form to function, you would assume that the really good ones could handle some of that stress and they wouldn't get out there and pop into place every time they sit down. I have no idea where Ryan is in this, but I'm hoping we're going the same direction. No, I'm not a fan of the snap, crackle, and popping of the pasterns at all. And again, you're formed to function in your mother nature, hocus pocus or whatever, and that the cows don't do it in the pasture. Well, first off, I have seen cows do it in the pasture. Number two, we're not judging the cows in the pasture. We're judging the animals out there in the show ring. <laughs> so therefore, I agree. it don't matter. I was trying to be nice. I was. You can be, be nice all you want. I'm not here to side. be nice. I'm not here to be nice. <laughs> I'm here to tell the truth. I am not a Democrat. Am I am I missing something, or do a lot of these popping pasterns go completely unmentioned when they're the cattle are being described in the show ring by others? Uh, I, th- I think that a lot of times that's probably you know, and again, it depends on the the given judge out there. Some people, like I have stated before on this podcast, some people think if they're a market animal and they can like physically walk in the ring, then they're good. I don't know many people that think breeding animals that way, but I still. There's still lots of people in that are, and these are competent, capable people. They just have differing opinions from you and I do that aren't different as critical. Right, different priorities and different opinions. 
doesn't mean I'm right or you're right or they're wrong. It's just difference. Uh, they're not as hard on structure. So, yeah, they let a lot of that go. Uh, and so, again, I, I, I use the term snap, crackle, and pop their pastors a lot. I, it is something that, you know, is a big, if you're doing that in, in a show ring under me, you're probably not going to get along real well. You know, we were you were talking about earlier how great these showmen are and all this other stuff, and I agree with that. And it doesn't matter whether it's cows or sheep, goats, pigs, whatever. I, I think that the thing is the ideal in terms of structural integrity that when we let those things go and they walk around the ring, everything holds together in terms of a balanced, kind of harmonized look still, and yet they still move and flex and fill their tracks and all that's right. And, you know, again, and talking about in cattle, one thing for me, and I guess this goes back to we've gotten so competitive and we've got all these things that help out. Uh, the one thing that I guess is more of a pet peeve for me now than anything else is, you know, you see these steers or heifers and, of course, 95% of them are woolly and hairy and all this stuff and they, they appear massive and a lot of them are. And they appear to have way more shape than what they'll ever need. And then they get out and move. And while they are really long-strided, fluid-moving animals, to have that much mass and dimension, they're really narrow at their base. And I don't have the hotline to Mother Nature like you do. But in my mind, not that it's a form-to-function thing or a Mother Nature thing, I have just always thought when they were built like that on the top half and then yet very narrow at the bottom in terms of their movement and their range and width of motion, I've always thought that was distracting because it just makes the whole picture and the whole aesthetic of that animal out of proportion to me. I would agree with that. I think it has a lot to do with the people doing a better job feeding, fitting all of those things and getting that body right. But it's so hard. We, we can't, there's not something we can necessarily do to get them to hit the ground wider. And as far as mother nature goes, mother nature is narrow from top to bottom. It's just narrow everywhere. So yeah, but I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And you know, you, when you see those animals stuck, if you just walked up to the class, they're all set up and they're not in motion. You would think, wow, these, these have got some mass to them and, and you're going to anticipate they're going to hit the ground a lot wider than what they do. And then when they go into motion, you start finding some issues. Let's move on to the the issue that I have in, in popping pasterns. And I threw it out there just because it, it has been a pet peeve of mine, but the, the rear hock, the flex to the rear hock, and we do put so much hair on these. We can, we can build those legs or clip those legs to look like the, the angles are correct, both front and rear. But when we go into motion, sometimes to me, and obviously each breed is going to be a little bit different how extreme it is, but I, I would like to see more genuine flex to the hock. When we don't have that flex to the hock, it seems like a little bit like the pigs. We have to try to compensate in the pastern. We have to swing our hip just a little bit more. And Ryan talked about filling that that track. And I think one of the keys to filling the track in, in terms of movement is flexibility in that that rear hock. I think our our knees are usually okay and our pasterns are sometimes okay, but the rear hock seems to be difficult. And I, I'm not sure why, other than the fact it's hard. I think we, we've talked about this with judging contests. Be careful what you call structurally correct or better moving or not as good moving, because I think flexibility of that rear hock, peep, a lot of people either aren't looking at it real close, or even if they do look at it, it's very subjective. And I'm not saying I'm right or Ryan's right or anybody, but there's that's, that's a difficult one to put your finger on. Well, I think your deal about the rear hawk, I think part of that is the way that cattle are built in their spine and out and through their hip, how that all ties together shows and articulates in terms of the way they move out of their hawk more than it does the front end, if you really think about it. I would agree. And when we build the body type that we're trying to build, it's hard. And so that that is why I think they're in like you said in the hogs, they gotta compensate somewhere to be this here, this here, this here. Well, in cattle, I think it's that rear hawk where we have more compensation than anything else. I would agree. And we, we see a lot of things. I, I know, and this is going to sound maybe like I'm, I'm being hypocritical here, but we talk about some of these 
body types as we take muscle out of them or allow those cattle to be a little more narrow. In general, some of those cattle seem to be able to get along a little better. I think it's just just part of it. The less mass, the easier moving, whether it's a pig or, or whatever it may be. And we're getting some of these these females or these breeding females so what I call flat dairy shouldered. Does that even make any sense, Ryan? Sure. Just narrow up front. Mother nature narrow. And and <laughs> then we want to open them up in that forerib so we, we fill that rumen up as much as we can and give us that big old swooping belly. But we go from that narrow flat shoulder into a narrow forerib into this massive rumen and body fill. And, and hopefully that, that gets us by if we put enough hair on there and get them a little bit fat. My gosh, it's it's hard to tell what they, they really are. So I, I compliment those out there feeding, fitting, breeding, all of those things because, wow, you, you, can, you can make them look the part. And it's difficult sometimes to distinguish. Is this one opened up enough? Am I just looking at fat and hair? Am I, where, where am I at on it? So it's, it's, it's interesting. This is a structure topic or whatever, but like I, I think the point that you made in terms of keeping them flat and smooth and pointing their shoulder and then you want this massive body and the, the connection in between those two is the floor rib. And so, again, I guess now, you know, I'm fortunate to get judge a lot, but I think one of the things that I see more than anything else or one of the things that I'm describing more than anything else is that I want to see these cattle more seamless in their transitions in terms of how they – transition out of their shoulder into their forerib and into their body wall. And so even though this is a, a structural topic, I do think that you made a valid point there. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to give you points when I can. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And, and, and getting all that to blend, that's, I mean, we, you've talked about it, Ryan. We can put muscle in them in a generation. Genetically, we can do it. We can feed it into them. We, there's a lot of ways to put that in there quick, but to get them built right and to transition and balance front to rear and, and transition like you're talking about, that's just flat hard. No way around it. Talking about movement and these kids sticking and whatever else, especially in cattle. And this is one thing, and cattle and sheep, I guess, are the two here. Like, they can be standing there and propped up, and you think that one is really good in terms of that one's spine. And then when we get that one in motion, either they tense and they tighten in that spine, or they actually sway and settle in terms of the way that they're made through their spine in motion. And you didn't pick that up when they were standing still. And so a lot of people say, why do you pull them off the move so much? Or why, you know, when it gets close, why do you just walk them again? Well, that's the reason why when you get any animal in motion. And again, I think that's a big reason I like judging pigs is because they're in constant motion. The little inconsistencies are going to shine through because you don't have some expert stick taking those out of there. And number two, when everything is in motion, all those moving parts and pieces, that's where you can see where the little flaws or the big flaws hit. And when you find that one, that when it's going in motion and it still puts together that harmonious, balanced, proportional picture and everything gives in flex, that's when you found the Snapchat worthy one. I love it. Perfect. And and there's so much to that. And and I, I think it's it's so critical that we continue. And, and, and that's complimenting these exhibitors that they can get them stuck so well that you walk up to it. And I can remember walking just, I go into the holding ring before some of these cattle go into the show. I'm walking through just observing the different, different animals and looking at their genetic background. I'm thinking, wow, these are really, these are deadly. And then boom, we go into motion. It's a lot easier to see that. And we're going to talk about that on sheep a little bit as well. Ryan, you and I have talked a little bit about this. What are what are some of the truly most functional cattle on the planet, breed wise? <laughs> you just you just gotta go there, don't you? You just can't help. You, I got to. Oh, well, I'm not. On, I'm go, down, not. go down that road. No, that's all you. Don't you lie about it. Do you not you lie get about back it. up on your phone with Mother Nature and you start the topics that you want to bring this shit out. You tell me, you tell me a little bit about, about era American cattle and what we can learn about structure from them. Uh, well, it depends on which one. The good ones. I honestly think, and I'm being very serious, and you're going to get me in trouble, and that's fine. I you're not think, you're not wanting to go down this path. I'm trying to. If you would just pipe down and talk to Mother Nature All more, right, go, go, go. 
I think that if you were on a judging team, a lot of those kids are sheep, goat, and pig kids, and they're not cattle kids. And while structure is universal, I think there's a lot of things. I think every judging team in America, no matter what you showed or what you raised or what you've judged, would benefit in going to watch a Brahmin open show or junior breeding show. Because you can literally see every type of structural scenario, good ones and bad ones, that there ever is. And people will say that's stupid and crazy and whatever, but I promise you, I've been around that breed enough that I think that anybody that goes and really studies all those cattle that walk in, no matter who's out there sorting them or what they say, and you have someone, they are guiding you through it, I think it could be one of the most beneficial things in terms of sorting structure you could ever do. I love it. I would agree with that wholeheartedly. And I I did not have the opportunity growing up to see many ear cattle. We'd go down to V8 Ranch in preparation for Houston. And and that's about the only time that I'd really get to look at them. And and then obviously at some of the, the national shows, but not very often. But I've always very, very much enjoyed it. And you think about where their emphasis is and survivability and being able to survive in, in harsh climate, all of those things. And we can kind of make fun of them up here in the north, the, the big hump and the steep hip and, and some of these other things. But if you study their angles, and you study their joints, and I'm not saying all of them, we have variation within every breed, but there's a lot of good eared cattle out there that truly get out there and flex and they go. And maybe you want to call it form to function. Maybe you want to call it mother nature. I don't care what you call it, but darn, they darn sure fill that step and they get out and they move and they look just as good on the move as they do stuck. And I'm talking about the better ones. I know obviously there's, there's a lot of variation there and I'm sure it'll continue to change, but I could not agree with Ryan more. And I wish when I was coaching, I would have had the opportunity to, to show more kids the ear cattle and I think if you can get them to open their minds up, it it really is of great benefit to just study and have somebody guide you through it. We've got one more species to hit real quick, and Ryan makes fun of me when I call them frame sheep, so we're going to call them breeding sheep, what you'll commonly see at Louisville in the open show. Uh, Here is an example of single trait selecting at its most extreme for many, many years. Then add on the ability to take some of the, the, the amazing fitters in the sheep world and carve that wool out like an artist would mold a sculpture. You ride on that. And that animal, oh, I mean, they are so good at it that you don't know what's underneath there. And they I have, put I'm the not, I'm cattle not. clippers to shame. If you've ever watched <laughs> them take one from point A to point Z, you're like, holy hell, how did you do that? And I'm going to compliment them saying that those things look amazing. But if we were to slick those things off after that many years of trying Ooh, to make them giants, oh, it, it is, about, it is. That'd be like the first year <laughs> we slick shirt steers. Don't talk about that. Oh, That's just tragic. Just amazing. And and I think that some of those breeds have tried to, to moderate and, and work on some things. But wow, did they, they go a very odd direction, straightening the joints, narrowing them up, no body, but they were darn sure tall. And there was a probably a five to 10 year, maybe even 15 year period you could send a young child out there with a yardstick and get those darn things placed right. Similar to maybe where where some of the cattle were back in the eighties, early nineties, just big. So that's, that's, that's interesting to me. And, and I think Ryan alluded to it earlier and I want to bring it up now and he's going to tell me I stole this from him in the weather industry. We have put so much, so much shag on these, these market lambs that out there propped up and these showmen are so good those hind legs look like they're just about perfect, don't they, Ryan? But boom, we go into motion. The easiest thing to do is sort some of those out that are pushing that top up, and they simply can't move off that hind leg. They and don't like to it me when that, you do that. I'm just telling no, you. I do it all the they, time. They don't like it. <laughs> but it's so why easy. I, mean, I will just, never get to judge a big sheep show because those people do oh, not I appreciate you, that. I think you will, you will because of it, because they've got to make them better hind We just can't put that much shag on them and carve it out and say, well, it looks really good because they just don't move well enough. I mean, the really good ones do, but isn't it, isn't the easiest thing to sort those sheep when they go into motion? It, it It's real. Like the tops go up and the hips go weird and the, le- the hind legs, yep. especially. And, and then again, you know, we've got these things. So, so shagalicious. They think that you just still can't see how pastern's, tighten or weaken and whatever, but you can, if you actually really look and, you know, evaluate, it's still there. But <laughs> I'm going to say again, they do not like it when you do that. They, no, they and, and if, you'd happen to, 
if you'd happen to miss one pushing its top on the move, once they get that one ready to set up, while you're looking at it, what are they going to do sometimes for you? Oh, they push it down while it's walking. It's so <laughs> fun. I'm like, I'm like, who? I think it's like throwing a red flag. Hey, hey, I've got a problem here. Who told you to do that, child? Because you didn't come up with that yourself. You just like showed the problem in the animal, which I was there and I saw it anyway. But now you have no. Whoever told you to do that, don't. I'm telling y'all right now, whoever thinks that you need to push the back down on the sheep while it's moving to camel, it, it does not work. It does not work. It does not help. Don't do it. You just draw attention. Even when they're stuck and the judge is looking, wait until we're not looking. Exactly. And and it must be pretty industry-wide, and I'm going to call myself ignorant to this because I must, they're all being coached to do so, and I'm not trying to be demeaning or or say i'm not either i'm just saying i don't think it's a good idea (laughs) no i and maybe other people are much more accepting i assuming others outside of you and i ryan are far more accepting of it but to me it's just telling me my sheep has a problem and it's that simple they don't even need to say any more about it it it, it really is to compliment those those kids out there showing when they've got some of those good ones the top end at these national shows stuck I mean, I don't know that you can paint a better picture. No, you can't. Uh, they are absolutely incredible. The showmen are really good. They're feeding like like nothing I've ever seen. It, it's 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 pretty amazing. And to even be able to breed that much shag on a leg, holy cow. This is a compliment to the lamb and goat exhibitors, breeders, enthusiasts, whatever. When it gets close in a class or a breed or a decision for me, and, you know, I've walked them and just said of that, I will ask those kids just to back off and hold those things. And you want to talk about blowing people's minds from the side of the, oh, dear Lord, I get, uh, they, 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 (laughs) whoo, you would think that I had set people on fire. But I just want them to stand back and hold them so you can see what that animal looks like just standing there naturally without any of that gifted and talented, you know, showmanship with it. And a lot of times, that is how I will decide a close placing. And oh, again, they they do no, they do not like that. And and I think in they all don't like that. You're complimenting the showman for being that good. Oh that no, it, it your- is it is a direct compliment to them. But the people on the outside of the route, oh lord, no, 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 they they get very very upset. <laughs> the most. Maybe you haven't experienced it, but I'm sure you've heard of it. But even at the state fair level, I remember a day there for a few years, they would turn those suckers loose on the top end out in the champion drive. A couple of them. Literally, I've seen I've seen it happen. I would get shot if I asked people to do that. But I, I don't blame them. No, can you imagine how much easier that? Had? And they did it for a while, and and it made things pretty easy. I know yeah, I, I never I witnessed that, and I never heard that. But I'm not going to say that I would disagree with it. But I'm telling you, I know the looks and the feedback I get when <laughs> I ask them to just hold them. I'm not good. I don't. I I really like my life, and I I, I don't want to die. I, I would love to see. I would like to be there when you do it. And, and I I've witnessed it a few times, and I think it went on there. I don't. It was kind of a trend for a few years, and that was long, long time ago. Very long. Okay. Well, Ryan, I appreciate it. We 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 didn't argue that much about skeleton and structural correctness, even without me having Mother Nature's bat phone number. It's a miracle. <laughs> exactly. It's time for question and answer. Mm-hmm. This week's question and answer is brought to you by Pope Joy Livestock Transportation. If you enjoyed listening to Beyond the Ring, please give Steve and Sarah the opportunity to prove themselves. You can gather details and route information on Pope Joy Livestock Transportation on their Facebook page. Ryan, the first question. And I'm not going to associate a name with this. See, this man lies. I pulled this up just before we recorded. People send him stuff privately. That I don't get to see, and he loves to put these questions on here that I ain't never heard of before. And he's like, and this is all you, gay. I'm like, (laughs) huh? It it is. You're right. First two questions came right through the Beyond the Ring. I think this one was even public, but I'm going to remove the name because I don't want to place judgment on any colleges. What advice do you have for a kid who is a part of a not-so-competitive JUCO livestock judging team that hopes to mark cards at a competitive senior college one day. I think that there, some of that you take care of as an individual because, again, even though if you're not on a competitive team, that doesn't prevent you from doing well individually. Uh, and again, some of, I mean, you know, everybody needs a good coach and stuff like that. So that's part of it. But I think 
strive to do the very best you can individually, regardless of your team. And I, I've stated many, many times, I think the reason that our team was so competitive and was won as much as it was did, I don't think that any of us really went into those contests concerned nearly as much about the team winning as how we were going to do as individuals. <laughs> And again, I'm not suggesting that's what everybody does. I'm just telling you what my experience on my judging team was. Uh, I think the other thing is, and I cannot stress this enough, and I tell people this and they're like, do you really think that matters? And I really do think it matters. I think you have to go and meet with those coaches and those that are going to be helping and find who you vibe with and who you gel with. And because If you're in a good headspace and you're having a good time and you enjoy the people that you're supposed to be listening to and learning from, then that is going to be a lot better and a lot more lucrative and conducive situation for you to have success and to get the possibility to mark cards than if you and your coach don't like each other or have bad juju. And that happens whether people want to admit it or not. It's out there. The truth. I agree completely, and I can relate this back in, in when I was recruiting high school students coming into junior college. There were students that I would bring in that had an, a wealth of experience, had a lot of success at the high school or 4-H and FFA level, and then there was others that came in maybe with a strong background, maybe a really competitive nature about them, maybe just incredibly intelligent, lots of different things, maybe without a lot of experience. And by the time they came around to their sophomore year, if they chose to put the effort in and push themselves and take advice from those coaches, they they became very competitive, even in the junior college ranks. And think of it this way. There's a lot of, not a lot, there's people, Ryan, we could use you as an example. Guess what? There's still kids out there having success at the senior college level that didn't compete in junior college at all. It's becoming fewer and fewer, but it can be done. I'm, I'm proof. And I mean, I know other kids that are, but like I said, on any time this judging deal has come up, I, I think some of the greatest things that I took away from things that I learned on the judging team was having to work with people that maybe you always didn't get along with being in stressful situations under pressure and stuff like that. And again, I, I truly believe that if you are in an environment where you are who, especially the person that you were supposed to look up to, take guidance from, who was supposed to be your leader, mentor person. If you respect that person, get along with that person, admire them, think that they're in the right direction, et cetera, you're going to be a lot better off than in a situation when that's not as much of the feeling or the case. So I firmly, and I cannot stress it enough, say go meet with those people at the colleges you're interested in and get a one-on-one vibe on how you think you would fit in with that person being your coach. Excellent. Excellent advice, Ryan. Thank you. Ryan, this question we've already had once, but I think it's very appropriate now that we see some of the election numbers come back in. But Josh Michael, and I think we've had this question. I've looked at it before, but I don't remember. Of course, you get to look at all the questions, unlike me. (laughs) This one's easy. You have mentioned in past podcasts that people are leaving the left-wing states by the thousands every day. Do you think people leaving change uh, the outlook on voter numbers in the Republican states they're moving into, such as Texas, I would say? The states they are leaving will remain blue. However, if enough leave, could they change some of the states and swing them from red to blue? I think we've answered this. We question, have answered this in question. Hind- and in hindsight, we can answer it better. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I really don't know if we can answer it better. I am the firm belief that when you flee California and New York, you're probably fleeing because of your economic opportunities aren't there. The taxes are so high. The business regulations are through the roof, et cetera. So you're trying to relocate to a place that that is not the focus. And so you would think that if that's why you're leaving one state and moving to another, then that would, then your politics would not be that far off from the state. But as we saw, I mean, Texas did not go blue. And actually it was a lot redder than what people want to admit because every congressional race, et cetera, went Republican. But the presidential election was as close as it's ever been. Some of that's because Trump's very polarizing and stuff like that. But 
And Florida was as red as it's ever been. Yes. So I think what we said by that, that you're trying to find a state where your politics align more, is primarily right. But there are, just like in everything else, instances and circumstances where that's going to differ a little bit. Yep, I would agree. And, and there is a little fearfulness that, I mean, Texas was probably closer than, than I would like it. All of them are closer than I'd like. Arizona, obviously. But yeah, there, there's no question it's going to have an impact. I'd like to, to lean the direction that Ryan states that you would assume they're, they're leaving for a reason. They would take that political stance that, that's a little more conservative. But it, it's hard, hard to say. But there's no question there are some moving that are probably liberal. And they're going into places like Austin and Houston and Dallas, San Antonio, all the bigger cities. And it's becoming well, more of a challenge. I'll tell you, I, I can't ever go back to Austin. It's, I mean, if I got asked to judge the Austin Livestock Show, of course I would. But I, I just, I, I, after my experience this last <laughs> time, I just don't think I can go visit that city for shits and giggles ever again. <laughs> I'm just telling you. And I used to have the best drunken times on 6th Street. And those days are gone. No, yeah, we don't need to talk about those days. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay, the final question comes to us from Lindsay. Did Ryan bedazzle his shoes? Was he clicking his heels similar to Dorothy, thinking there's no place <laughs> like the Miss USA pageant? See? This must have been on your Snapchat. No, it was on my Snapchat and my Facebook. But anyway, uh, no, I did not do those. Those are Prada. I bought them. I did buy them <laughs> for the Miss USA pageant. And you know, I just thought they were Can so I, bad. I want to stop right here. It would have been cheaper to bedazzle them, would it not? That's what not the point. What, what did they cost? I am. You answer that's like the asking question. a lady her age. I don't, don't ask. Yeah, you're those right, things. and I don't mind. I don't no. mind. Doing, I have no problem with it. What did they cost, Dale? Uh, you already have enough medical issues. What was the brand? What was? Just tell me the brand. I told you Prada. Okay. And so I'll look you, up. you have enough medical issues already. We don't need to talk about the price <laughs> of my wardrobe. But no, they I, they did not put them. And yes, I was kind of like doing the Dorothy, there's no place like home thing because I couldn't think of anything else cute to do to show off my cute little shoes that I needed to. So, but yeah, that, that was kind of the gist. Of, but <laughs> there we go. They're fabulous. Actually, Excellent. they're so fabulous. I'm judging a hog show in San Angelo and the man that hired me to judge the hog show posted on my Facebook that I need to wear those shoes to judge that hog oh. show. Which, again, that's not going to happen because they're too expensive to be traipsing around in hog shit. But anyway. <laughs> I will try to look up that price for next week. For <laughs> Thank you, Dale. For I'll so do my glad. best. Thank you. Well, Ryan, fine. I, hopefully this has helped some understand structural correctness more and, and that everybody isn't going to use the same terminology and see it the same. And, and Ryan and I have talked about this with relation to judging contest and oral reasons, same goes across the board here that everybody isn't going to see things exactly the same. You know where Ryan and I stand on it. I think we've, we've made it clear, and hopefully we brought out some points, even Mother Nature, mm. um, that, that are relevant and some form to function, but we still need to keep a balance. We need to keep that show ring look, the circus animal direction like we like to find in the goats, going the right direction. But it's been enjoyable. Until next week, be safe. Y'all come back now, you hear? And I see your asses in Louisville. <laughs>